Is it working? There we go. I said something mean about you, but you couldn't hear me. Uh, some of you may not know this, but before this chapel, I have, um, this is really what I see as the last of a series of three, giving some public reflections on the more practical side about questions related to suffering. The first um, was a reflection on faith, hope, and love. The second was a reflection on the place of confession. And today I want to talk about, can I have a witness? Um, please pray with me. Father, sometimes the realities on the ground that we see overwhelm. And it is easy for us to believe those are the only reality. Would you lift our gaze? Would you help us to love one another well that together we might see your Son? It's in his name we pray. Amen. How... How is she doing? The door opened in a hospital room and quietly and gently in walked Randy Neighbors, a friend and pastor. It was 2008 and I was sitting beside the hospital bed of my wife Tabitha who was recovering from a cancer surgery. And he whispered, how is she doing? About an hour or so earlier, I had watched as my, at the time, my three-year-old and my five-year-old left the hospital holding the hands of a grandmother and a very dear friend. And as they went, I knew it would be weeks and I'd never been away from them that long before I got to see the kids again, as they went to California and we tried to figure out, tried to get our footing. And into that context, Randy walked in and his voice was tender, it was concerned, and it was gracious. And so I tried to respond. But you might relate to this, no words came out, only tears. So then we sat for a while, and after a little bit I tried again, but this time the tears turned to uncontrollable gush. Not wanting to wake up Tabitha, we both moved out to the lobby and just sat there, people bustling about. And every once in a while he would try and say something, and it didn't have to be anything profound or serious, he would try and say something or ask me a question. And I would my, open my mouth to try and speak, and I simply couldn't. He was gentle and patient, and after a time, both of us knew I could not speak, and he did not need to. He had come, he had witnessed. He had agreed that the grief was warranted and he knew he had no explanations, no cliché to help, only his presence and his prayers. So in the end, he put his hands on me and he prayed. That was all he could do. And that was all I could receive. What I needed was a witness what we do for one another. So my two best friends, Jay Green and Jeff Morton, do for me and I hope to do for them. We all need a witness. I don't know if you saw this in the news, but last week there was a woman who, in France who randomly walked up to a group of college students and threw acid on them. And then after she did it, she sat down on the floor, on the ground, and waited. 
She waited for the police to come, and when they came, she had photographs. She wanted to show them because she had had acid thrown on her. And she wanted to tell them about it. And so the way she got their attention was by throwing acid on these others. Listen, the woman was mentally unwell and she needs help. And just so you know, the students are actually okay. It ended up being minor burns. But I tell this extreme example to say because all of us have what you might even think of as like a, like a prim- primordial, primeval like need to have our pain witnessed. We all, everyone in this room, needs a witness. And I want to talk about that today as we think about how do we respond to those who suffer. Because suffering can come in various forms. It can be experienced in different ways. Whether we're talking about a hurricane in Houston, or someone dealing with the difficulty of abuse, Someone dealing with daily debilitating pain or someone dealing with the weight of social injustice. Each of these cases is distinct, it's particular. It needs its own response, but each of them also brings its own trauma. And all of us deal with these things differently. Some of us in this room, when you face these kind of things, you you try and deal with it in silence. Some others, it's through outburst of rage. Some, it's, it's almost like an athletic commitment to do this thing. Some try and cultivate a stoic detachment. Some respond with a sense of shame. But even amid the different personalities and differences of response, what I don't think we always appreciate is that there is real power simply walking alongside someone going through their particular experience, bearing witness to the real challenges. So we need to talk about witness. When I say witness in a context like this, many of you will just assume we're talking about a a Christian talking about Jesus or Christianity with a non-Christian. But actually, Within the Christian tradition, that's not all of these cases. That, that more often refers to what we call evangelism. In the Christian tradition, witness also plays a very important place within the people of God. We bear witness to one another. And when we talk about witness in this way, there, it's always twofold when it's at its best. It's always twofold. On the one hand, it is about acknowledging that our troubles are real. Acknowledging our troubles are real. And on the other hand, it is about witnessing to the fact that God is unflinchingly faithful. Anyone with a knowledge of the history of the black church in America or personal experience in such churches, recognizes the power of this practice. To this day, it's common in such services to hear uh, the minister or someone speaking or someone else say, I need a witness. I need a witness. And normally that is said when either they are speaking to the reality of some kind of pain, whether it's personal or the community's, Or, they're talking about the surprising ways in which God has shown up. Testify. Testify. Those words of encouragement ring out in such a context. What I need you to see though, is we need a witness both for the pain and for the provision. For the pain and the provision. Because those voices and that witness keeps you sane. Stacy and Juan Floyd Thomas explain this in one of their books. This is what they write. Black worship becomes an activity of nurture that bears witness to the activity of God. It shows awareness and concern for life's realities. 
It provides nourishment in the form of communal solidarity and pastoral awareness and response. Beloved, this is where I think those of us in predominantly white Protestant churches have much to learn from our sisters and brothers in the black church tradition. We have got to grow in our ability to hear other people's laments. To be able to hear them and respond, yes, that is terrible. Even as they also encourage us that it's not merely a fantasy that in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the storm, they think they see signs of God's presence and faithfulness. Not that the storm is good. Not that the injustice is good. Not that the pain is good. But that in spite of that, God can still be present and gracious. We do not need to pick between hardship and divine concern. Too often we pit those against one another. Witnessing another person's pain and laments actually gives us the opportunity to find rest. I'm, I'm, my guess is I'm not alone in this. Maybe some of you can relate. I know most of you aren't married, but maybe it's a roommate for you or something like that. But if I, if I get home, right, and I get home and something happened at work or someone said something or I got some email or something that I think is really upsetting, and for the sake of argument, let's just say I'm in the right here. <laughs> And I get home and I tell Tabitha, my wife, about it. I said, I, this is what happened. And as I start to tell her, she starts to enter into my frustration. She starts to say, oh, I can't believe that. I can't, really? You know what happens to me? As she gets concerned and frustrated, I calm down. It's a funny thing. That's not true of everybody, but that is a true of a lot of us. Actually, as she gets, as she shows concern, I am allowed to start calming down. Because what I need is not for someone to tell me it's okay. I need for someone to acknowledge that something is wrong. That I am not insane. Now, let's imagine... If I go home, or you go to your roommate, you're upset about something, maybe an injustice from a professor. Imagine. <laughs> and you go to your roommate, and you say, I can't believe this is what happened, and this is what happened. And they say, their response is, it's no big deal. How do you respond? Do you go, oh, you're right. <laughs> no, you raise your voice. You get louder, you get more upset. Beloved, when an individual or a whole community has to get louder, has to get angrier, has to keep saying things and use more and more examples, and, and we respond, ah, it's not as bad as you think. You and I should ask, why are they having to be so loud? Why are they having to keep saying it? Because the fact is, it's probably that we have not borne witness. And until they believe that we believe it, they don't have another choice. But when someone comes along and feels the frustration, testifies to it, I no longer feel isolated. I no longer need to convince others you, you see, actually, the geography of our suffering has changed. We're, we're somewhere different. We're somewhere new. We have moved from the island of isolation to the mainland of community. Now, I should mention, there are dangers here. There are dangers here, just as an aside. If people who are suffering... We need to be aware, if you're someone who's suffering, you need to be aware of abusing other people. Put it this way, if you find that you only dump on other people and you never encourage them, right? If, if you find that you always bring turmoil to others, 
but you never serve? If you only achieve your equilibrium by creating chaos in others, then there's a problem. Because the second half of witness is not being observed. That's a danger, but do not let that potential danger erase everything I just said. It goes without question, we all need a witness to the reality of the hurts and the pains. But we also must speak not just of the pain, but of Christ, of redemption and of hope. So let's turn to God's presence and our laments. God's presence and our laments. Some years ago, Mary came to see me because she wanted to talk. The memories and the grief were too much. She was overwhelmed by experiences in her case of things that she had witnessed, things that she had experienced in her childhood. In her case, she had grown up on a Native American reservation. And she had experienced and seen truly difficult things. In particular, her nights were often filled with the memory of a little girl that her family reached out to and ended up bringing into their home and sought to care for her in a very difficult situation and they saw up close just how serious the pain of dysfunction and abuse could be. And Mary couldn't escape these thoughts, these memories, these crushing weight. And she wondered what to do. And in her case, she knew she should lament, but she was finding it suffocating. All the grief, all the sadness. As I listened to Mary, I actually wondered what to say. And then it finally occurred to me. Mary was right. Mary was right. Her lament was killing her. And I couldn't solve the problem. And suddenly the pieces of the puzzle began to come together for me to make sense. If you or I could ever fully lament, not just for ourselves, not just for our own things, but for others, for the world, listen, if that could ever happen, it would kill us. Literally. Literally. A girl with great pain said to me, I just don't have the time and the energy for the laments. I've seen too much sorrow growing up. She was speaking the truth. A full lament is deadly. And you know how I know that? And you know how you know that? Because Jesus fully and truly enters into lament for the world and it kills Him. It kills Him. He dies. And in His case, His lament was for the world. He bore witness. He was the witness. This is the wonder of the Christian imagery of the cross. It, it testifies both to the reality of sin and death, but also to God's presence and His love. He enters into our laments so they don't have to kill us. My God, my God, why have You forsaken me? Jesus knew lament and it crushed Him. But thanks be to God, He rose from the depths of of despair and the grave. He rose and lives even now so that we are allowed, even invited, to lament. But we must take those laments ultimately to God. Yahweh alone can absorb our frustrations. He doesn't fret by our questions and our struggles. Sally Brown her excellent work in the Psalms. And I don't have time to talk about the Psalms very much here, so just before you graduate, take Scott Jones' class, okay? 
But Sally Jones says this, what ultimately shapes biblical lament is not the need of the creature to cry its woe. As important as that is. It's not ultimately just the need of the creature to cry its woe, but she says, but the faithfulness of the God who hears and acts. We need a witness. Hope comes to us not by denying or downplaying our pain, but by acknowledging it before God. The God who responds with compassion. Let me conclude. We will discover hope. I really believe this. We will discover hope only when we're ruthlessly honest about what lies between us and that hope. And beloved, the church, you and I, we deny the power of the Gospel when we trivialize grief. We deny the power of the Gospel when we trivialize grief, when we belittle physical pain, when we ignore social injustice, and when we over-spiritualize our existence in such a way as to make a mockery of the Creator Lord. Faithfulness to the Gospel requires us to deal with the messiness of human hurt and grief. You and I, we must learn to be truly honest with ourselves, with one another, and with God. Our theology demands it. And our God and our stories require it. But together, together, giving and receiving witness. I believe we can discover afresh the scandalous grace of God so often spoken about, but so rarely truly savored. Please pray with me. Our God, it is true, there are many times where we wonder, are you there? Or worse, we are struggling to believe that you're there and unconcerned. So we thank you for your body, the church, your people that can give real hugs that can be really present. That Your presence and compassion might be known and experienced. Would You give us the courage to tell our stories? And would You give us the courage to hear others? Would Your grace and love be more real though than our pain? Help us as a community to be a people of truth. To speak the truth of the wrongs and to speak the truth of Your kindness. We pray all this in the name of the One who was not only crucified, but rose. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.